Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone who is here at the university today. Also welcome to everyone who is watching us from home. Um, my name is Alicia Praga. I'm a journalist from the economic desk of the Standard and I have the honor to take you through this afternoon. Um, topic of today is a good life within the planetary boundaries. Whether we just think about the rising temperatures, the incredibly alarming warming of the oceans, news about crop failures and water shortages, or um, the fierce opposition that we have seen against the nature restoration law of the EU, I think it's clear how timely the summer universities are going to be that you're going to follow um, over, the next, over the next weeks. Um, looking for the program, I must say, um, I am really looking forward to seeing the ideas and solutions that you're going to discuss. And, um, and also today already I would love to hear your input especially. There will be mics going around um, during the panel discussion. And we will also have a Slido where everyone who is at home can put in questions already. Or if you're here and you don't want to wait with your questions, you can already put them into Slido so we can read them out later. Um, and our colleague Clara Kuppelwieser will read them out for us. Um, and the slide we will show a bit later um, where you can see the links. But enough from my side now. We will hear a few introductory points of, um, by different speakers after we have 15 minutes of presentations, followed by a half an hour break in which we'll have coffee and cake where we can um, recharge our batteries a little bit for the panel. And then um, after the panel, we would like you to, uh, we would like to invite you to a buffet outside where we can get to know each other a little bit better. I now uh, want to um, start with the introductory words that the Austrian president, Alexander van der Bellen, has for you. Ladies and gentlemen, for 25 years now, ERD student housing provides residences for students from all around the globe. But it is not only about facilitating accommodation. Sustainability has always been at the heart of the mission. Since 2004, new student residences are built in the energy-saving passive house design and existing dorms were retrofitted with photovoltaic systems. Each year, this commitment allows thousands of students from all over the world to live in so-called passive houses during their time at university, as well as to learn about eco-friendly building practices during summer schools. A few years back, when I was university commissioner of the city of Vienna, I was lucky to get to know both of the summer schools, hence I know firsthand they are a tremendous success. Thank you all for raising awareness and sharing your knowledge about sustainable building and alternative economic systems. So let me just say happy 21st birthday, ÖAD student housing. Thank you for inspiring future generations. I'm hopeful the knowledge you share will contribute to shaping a better world. I would now like to um, introduce you to Gernot Wörter. He is the Deputy Managing Director of the Climate and Energy Fund, which is helping funding this, this summer program. What an impressive sight. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to be here because today we talk about a very important topic. We are talking about climate change, which is one of the defining issues of our time. And it's not only that, it's also a race against time. As you all know, our carbon budget is shrinking really, really fast. And we also have planetary boundaries we have to stay within. So this is no easy thing we are talking about today. And for the beginning, I have some bad news for you. There is no one single simple solution to it. But there are solutions to it, and it's a race for survival. And like every race, you win it with the same strategy. You take one step at a time. And the first step is to understand things, to discuss things, 
and to find solutions together. And with these two summer schools, I think this is a very first important step towards solving the climate issues because the, these two summer schools are addressing two very big sectors of emissions. The one is the climate, um, sorry, the, the green building sector. And mind you, Europe is built. You have to change an uh, existing running system. It's very hard to change such a system. But if you don't change the housing, the uh, building sector, we can't succeed in being climate neutral. And the other summer school, it's about uh, alternative monetary systems. And this is even more important because the monetary system is on the one hand very good established, but it's also the backbone of all our economic activities. So if you change that, you change the whole game. And this is really important for our survival because we have to have new solutions, new approaches. And having said that, I'm happy to be here. I'm also happy that the Climate and Energy Fund is able to support these two summer schools because they contribute greatly to understanding the problem, uh, finding new solutions, communicate and develop new, new ideas. And having said that, I wish you all a very interesting afternoon today. And those of you who will participate in the summer schools, uh, I greatly wish you rewarding insights, new ideas, and also <coughs> and also new projects you start with so that because we need the solutions you have in mind and which you will develop in the three weeks you're working on it uh, better today than tomorrow. Thank you very much. Which, oh, no. Next one up is Kurt Hofstetter from the city of Vienna, which also makes to, um, helps to make this program happen. Thank you so much. Uh, dear participants for so many different countries all over the world, I'm very thankful and honored to be here today uh, as a representative of the city of Vienna. Uh, the city is supporting these summer schools uh, for quite some time and we are uh, very lucky to have uh, this opportunity every year again uh, in the summer. Now, as we already heard, we have uh, three weeks of very intense discussions just ahead of us, uh, the green soli solution buildings and the alternative uh, economic systems. In the summary for this event, the question was raised how we could achieve a good life for all without exceeding the ecological limits. And we all know that we have been exceeding those limits a lot in the past, but it's only since a few years, at least in my experience, that we can discuss that without being quickly pushed into a strange corner of unrealistic dreamers. It's quite late, but it's still good. So most of the speakers and lecturers and professors uh, you will hear today and during the upcoming three weeks have been working as researchers and on preparing the ground for creating alternative solutions for a long time, including our presidents we just saw. Their knowledge and experience as well as their ongoing support and your experience and inspiration, your good and strong motivation and your brilliant minds are the ground for new developments that shall lead us some steps further into answering some of the burning questions we are facing all over the world. Vienna is well known as a, a city of high living quality. In part, this is due to a long tradition, strong attitude, and also good luck. And in part, it is due to hard work and constant changes of measures, while at the same time maintaining the major values and dignified principles. In this sense, maintaining the major values and dignified principles I wish for you and for the city of Vienna, that the results of your exchanges, discussions and learnings throughout the upcoming three weeks will be heard and discussed further and help to achieve a good life for all without exceeding the ecological limits of our planet. Good luck and don't forget to enjoy the city. Next, we will hear from Doris Damjanovic. She is the Vice Rector of Boku University. Yeah, 
Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, especially also dear students, dear colleagues, I welcome you to the open ceremony of the SAM University Alternative Economic and Monetary Systems and Green Building and Solutions. I also warmly welcome colleague Hofstetter from the uh, City of Vienna and also Gernot Werther from the Climate and Energy Fund and we are very happy that you support also this uh, summer school. Afterwards, we have uh, quite good speakers uh, for today, and uh, you will uh, introduce them later on with Renate, Renate Hammer, Helga, Professor Helga Kromkoll, and Annika Daffe. And I also welcome the moderator, she uh, has introduced herself before, Alicia Praga from The Standard. And especially the ones that are very important are the students, the young colleagues which are here. And as uh, you said before, looking for solutions from different perspectives. On one hand, te very technical one, but also social one and ecological one. So we are coming from all different perspectives and I think this is maybe also the way to find solutions to tackle the climate issues for the next years. Uh, to um, who are the groups which are here uh, the next days, um, especially the participants and also the alumni of the two summer universities, as we said before, alternative economic, monetary system, and the green building solutions. And there is also uh, a group of 12 students and supervisors from Beirut Arab University, Lebanon, including associate professor in faculty of architecture, design, and build environment, and I hope I pronounce uh, the names in the right way. It's Professor Baha Farahat and also coming from Ragi al and Mava Dabaye. I hope that's right. And they're doing special also lectures on passive house design and high-tech architecture. There are also participants from the Young Scientist Summer Program of the YASA and also different interested groups which are here, but also online. I also welcome all the audience which are online. So a very well welcome to all of you. And, and somebody said is we are in a really great room today, and it's also quite cool in here. Uh, many thanks also to the University of Vienna for allowing to be here and having also this event today. And regarding to the POCO, which I am the representative from the rectorate today, is that it's very important that not we are talking or discussing sustainability, also the whole event is in a sustainable way in order to, in, um, to keep the environmental impact as minimum. So it's an eco event and also especially we have a coffee break and later on also uh, um, uh, some, uh, some food, it's organic, regional and seasonal products at the buffet. So all food is vegetarian or vegan. Coming back to the content of the next days, you heard some before. I think this is a long uh, collaboration, so it's not the first time and uh, the green building solution is going on now the 13th time, so that's quite for a long time. The other, the IMS Summer University is the 10th time, so we have quite a long experience working together on these topics um, and to think about solutions and I think it's always important to discuss it. What's important and also what we refer to is to the sustainable development goals of the UN. It's not new for the ones who are here, but still it's very important and it's one of the global policy which is important to really reach also the, the climate issues. And you know it's adopted in 2015 and it's a really one of the big things. And uh, regarding the POCO, we are having also an Austrian uh, alliance on this. It's the Alliance Sustainable University of Austria, UNINETS in German. Uh, we're really uh, working on these SDGs, like on the SDG 13, 5 or 11, but also on the other ones. So what I, I hope uh, it's going on, the discussion are going on, finding the solution, and as mentioned before, one are coming more from this uh, contribution um, to present viable alternatives to process and develop um, the economic, ecological and social boundaries and the other one are coming more from the green building solution addressing new ways to think, design and construct and use of building which is also very important and it's one of the big issues to get CO2 neutral, to get in the building sector. I think this is one of the big things what also especially in Vienna is a big debate what the city has. Coming a little bit back to the POCO where I'm coming from, 
Uh, climate issues are one important thing in our different programs, what you have at the BOCO, if it's bachelor, master or PhD. And as I said before, we are not coming only from one side. It's always important to look on the technical part, but also on the ecological and also on the social part to find solution. And the good thing, as you see also in the summer school, is it's important to debate multidisciplinary, but also transdisciplinarity is an important thing to really have involved a lot of stakeholders, which are the ones who implement these things. And we are very happy that the POCO cooperates for quite a long time with several organizations, like the URD Student Housing, the Technical University, and other uh, uh, groups, and in the city of Vienna. So what I wish you is the next days, and um, I think uh, normally in planning we always work on case studies, so you can have also some, um, maybe some strolls around the city of Vienna, that you have a, a great two weeks, uh, have a lot of exchange, finding good solutions, and have a great time in Vienna and at the universities. Um, and I wish you also a good uh, event for today and, and a good discussion. Thank you very much. The next person that we're going to hear from has been busy organizing this event for the past couple of months, or maybe even years if we think of previous editions, Günther Jedlitzka from, from the ÖRD. Uh, I do not... Ah, great. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear students. It's great that you are all here. We are the first time at the University of Vienna, and it's one of the oldest universities in Europe, uh, set up in 1365, so more than 750 years ago. This building is built in the 19th century, so also quite old, and we are really happy to be the first time here at the university. Well, that's the reason why we are here fighting climate change. That's the reason why we set up these two uh, universities. Uh, I will split my presentation in three units. First of all, I will speak about reading books, what else? Then about our organization, ÖRD Student Housing, and last but not least, ÖRD Summer Universities. Well, uh, these books influenced me enormously. One is Die Grenzen des Wachstums, Limits of Growth, uh, it was written nearly 50 years ago, and the other one, Factor 4, uh, written by Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker, president of the Club of Rome. And in this book I read the first time about the Passive House. It was in the 90s when I read that, and it inspired me enormously. <clears throat> well, also two books which I can highly recommend. One is by Erich Fromm, Haben oder Sein. It shows what is essential maybe in life, if it is to have or to be. And the other one is by Viktor Frankl, also very famous Austrian. He wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning. Well, and last but not least, these three books uh, were essential for the other summer university, for the alternative economic and monetary system. First of all, the Skeld syndrome. It's about interest, compound interest, and all the problems. With, uh, with the interest, then uh, change everything, or Gemeinwohlökonomie, uh, the economy for the common good by Christian Felber, he will also teach at the Summer University, and last but not least, Vollgeld, or the, the English term is sovereign money, or uh, positive money. Well, ÖRD student housing, here you see tiny Austria, here you see all the uh, university cities where we are located and where we accommodate international students from all over the world. Well, we are a 100% subsidiary of the ÖRD and we are, that's very important for us, uh, a non-profit company. So we do not make any profit at all. Well, some other facts and figures. We accommodate around 10,000 international students per year, around 75% uh, in Vienna, and around 30% live in one of our passive houses. And eight dorms uh, are built in, in, in passive house construction, 
and all use solar energy by photovoltaic systems. <coughs> well, in 2005, uh, uh, we built uh, Walkereistrasse. At that time, it was the first student dorm in passive house construction in the world. And we are still very happy with the house. It's in the second district, very close to the University of Economics. Well, another, I think, uh, very great project, it's, we, we did that for the Montagne University in Leoben. It's nearly completely in wooden construction and it was finished in 2016. Also a passive house with photovoltaic on the roof. Well, here you see how it looks inside. It looks like more a hotel than a student dorm. Uh, yeah, everything in, in, in wooden construction and uh, students are very happy there. Yeah, why we are here? Uh, I also lay, like aphorism or sayings. I think this saying fits very good to our, some universities. Uh, it's by Victor Hugo. It's, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And hopefully we have these ideas. Another saying by Wilhelm von Humboldt, uh, enlighten yourself and then affect others by what you are. So that's what we are trying uh, during our summer universities. Well, on the one hand, we have the big problems. On the other hand, I think we have a couple of solutions. We will concentrate more on the solutions, but we also will show where the problems are. Well, just to give you an idea what we are doing at the Alternative Economic and Monetary System, just a question to, to the public. You see the Austrian uh, public debt at the moment is 360 billion euro. How much do you think is interest and compound interest? Is it 10%, 30%, 50% more? Are there any guesses? Well, I can tell you it's 85%. And before the Corona crisis, it was 97%. So you see the problem of interest and compound interest. Well, another saying, beginning of the 20th century by Henry Ford, he said, it's well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system, for if they did, there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. I think in fact, the, the system not, has not really changed. And I think that's also one aim of our summer university, that the students will understand what is going wrong and where there are the alternatives. <clears throat> well, one, one of these alternatives is, is, I mentioned it before, it's Vollgeld or sovereign money or positive money. It's the English term. Uh, just to show you a couple of advantages, uh, for, of sovereign money, it's, there would be no uh, problem with interest on compound interest, or nearly no problem. The, uh, the economy no longer has to grow. Uh, money creation only by the National Bank. Currently, it's 90 to 95% by private banks. And that's also very important. Money at your bank account is 100% secure. Uh, at the moment, it's not secure if the bank uh, goes bankrupt. Well, Maggie Thatcher, a Prime Minister in the UK in the 80s, uh, she said there is no alternative and we changed that to there is no alternative for alternatives. I think a game which everyone knows, it's called DKT, das Kaufmännische Talent, or the English term is Monopoly. I played that when I was a child, I played that with my children and at the end the winner takes it all and normally just one person wins. And in fact, it's interesting that this game uh, uh, is like our monetary and financial system. Well, and last but not least, finally, for our students, I will tell you, say it to you, come on, start now. It's very important to be courageous, zack, 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 and be clever. Thank you. Our next speaker is the academic head um, of the Summer University for Alternative Economic and Monetary Systems. She's a renowned meteorologist, Helga Kromkolb.
Good afternoon. I studied at this university. Um, at the time, we were fighting against very traditional ways of teaching, very traditional knowledge that, well, that doesn't sound right now, uh, but, but uh, uh, teaching, well, with methods of the past centuries, essentially. Uh, and meanwhile, my fight has changed and I'm fighting something much more important, I think, but um, it's very connected. I think we really need uh, education. Education is the basis for change, in my opinion. And I was very happy when Günter Gedlitzka uh, uh, invited me to start a summer school together with him, with his support and with his team uh, on alternative economic and monetary systems. Now, you might wonder why a meteorologist is head of, an, of a course for alternative economic and monetary systems. Uh, but the idea is that we need an economic and a monetary system that is um, well suited to tackle problems like climate change, like biodiversity loss, to, to find ways to live within the boundaries of our planet and to lead a good life within those boundaries. And my experience of the last more than 10 years is that um, we have splendid teachers of economics, we have splendid teachers of uh, financial systems with very revolutionary new ideas. Uh, but uh, very rarely is uh, the environmental issue, the ecological issue, really at the core of their thinking, uh, even at the fringe of their thinking. And we're trying to pull these three aspects together, these three dimensions together. And um, it's difficult. It's really difficult to, to, uh, to, to do that uh, because everybody is so engrossed in their own field, even economists and financial specialists don't very often talk with each other, at least not sufficiently to really come up with, uh, with good solutions. Uh, so don't expect to hear solutions during the course. Uh, you will hear very many different um, aspects that might be part of a solution, but you will not get the solution for our problems. Uh, and we will have to work on that together. We will have to work together to find solutions. And we're very happy to have people with very many different backgrounds uh, in our courses. Uh, the interchange between students and between students and teachers um, at the same level uh, is really something which uh, makes this, these summer schools uh, extremely uh, profitable, I think, for everybody. And I hope this year will be no exception. And I wish you all a very nice three weeks here. Um, at the end, you will say, but I didn't hear anything about A, about B, about C. Well, unfortunately, three weeks are rather short, uh, and we cannot handle everything. But if you have questions, if you do think that something important is missing, then just um, come up uh, to the teaching staff, and maybe we can find a solution. Maybe we can find the slot uh, that is still open, so we can also discuss these questions, which uh, seem uh, important and urgent to you, and they probably are, and they were left out in the program. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Now we'll change to the Green Building Solutions Summer University. Um, we'll hear from Karin Stielhoff. She's the academic head um, of this Summer University and expert in sustainable um, architecture. I may say good afternoon in the meanwhile with uh, dear participants and uh, dear colleagues, dear all. We have met already this afternoon and started to discuss uh, many topics that we will all hear, um, that we will deal with in the next weeks, next three weeks. My duty today is to say to bring the welcome greetings from TU Wien, from the Vienna University of Technology which is partner uh, of, the, of these summer, summer schools. Uh, it's also an old university. university. Uh, we see it from the building quite similar style from the same time. It was first um, founded as a Polytechnical Institute and then renamed it as Vienna University of Technology. Uh, there is a strong mission, of course, more technically, uh, concerning basic research and uh, application of uh, uh, application-oriented university research. 
uh, facts and figures. It is, uh, I think it's uh, the biggest or one of the biggest um, universities of technology, not only in Austria, but also in, in Middle Europe. It has approximately 27,000 students. And what is very important, most of them, so it's 35.4% uh, of them, go to, the, go to the construction industry. So that's quite much. Um, and so they're not only architects, but also spatial planning that we will deal with during the, the project, uh, uh, project task that we're going to work on, but, uh, and, and, but also and civil engineering. Also there's, of course, also mechanical engineering, um, electrical engineering, industrial engineering, chemistry, um, technical mathematics and technical physics. All these goes together with concerning the construction and the planning of uh, buildings. There are about 3,000 degrees per year and approximately 5,400 staff full time. Well, what is the mission statement of the Vienna University of Technology? It's technology for the people, so applied uh, technology. It is based on the freedom of research and, and teaching and on participation, participation which is most important. Uh, research and development uh, are in the center and towards scientific excellence. There are five main research areas computational science and engineering, quantum physics and quantum technologies, materials and master, which already have to do with, with our topics, information and communication technology. Again, if you don't communicate um, all that has to do, to do with the environment, uh, and there are some very, very good uh, experts here today, um, um, it will not happen. I think that's what we uh, saw during the last years and energy and environment, which is, of course, the course topic that we, that we also will deal with in, with in this summer course. It is, you have, um, some of you have already been there today. It's uh, located in, uh, in geo, from the geopolitical and cultural uh, aspect, uh, excellently in the center of one of the most uh, attractive and livable cities in the world, so this is, might also be an important factor that we uh, go for, uh, especially when we look on the temperatures that we see all around Austria just now. It is a gateway to Eastern Europe and Middle East on all levels. That is important because we want to integrate uh, these students, not only at the university, but also in this course. For the recruitment of students and employees as conference venue, for the invitation and implementation of strategic, strategic cooperation, as well as for the settlement and funding of innovative companies. The TU Wien promotes the growth of Vienna as a business and science location in the center of Europe. Well, um, this is a plan, maybe you have already a map, and most of the uh, locations are in the fourth district, just very close to the center, historic center of Vienna. Well, there we will meet also once uh, in, in this, uh, in, in, in To the Sky, which is an exemplary project at the Campus Getreidemarkt. It is the so-called Plus Plus office uh, building of the, of the uh, TU Wien. We will also meet there once with a very different location. It is uh, an old hall, um, so that that uh, shows that a building with wood can last, and that uh, wood can also be a very beautiful building material. Uh, we have heard it today quite often in the presentations of the students already. Well, of course, tra transfer and knowledge uh, for training uh, excellent specialists on a scientific basis are in the, uh, in the focus and preparation of graduates and of course the uh, expansion of knowledge and techno technology transfer should lead to um, a life that is suitable for making our world more livable, uh, human and socially ac acceptable. Innovation, without innovation I think uh, things will not change. Uh, this is one of the most important uh, topics concerning the change of um, the change or the, the, the fight against climate change. And um, 
there the, the, the interaction between the basic research and application-oriented research um, uh, is, is important and it should, it should lead to the transfer from theory to practice, from the basis to application, so it, uh, in the sense of an innovation and entrepreneurial university that includes all essential areas. Teaching, uh, uh, communicate comprehensive com uh, competence, uh, well, uh, here are the um, technical knowledge and technical skill, skills should be, um, should be handed over. The promotion of communicative and social skills, competitiveness of our graduates, solid basic training, ability to acquire knowledge independently and a wide range of training opportunities. Quality uh, that does not, uh, I think this is, so should be a very general remark, a degree from a university of technology but also from the other university is a seal of quality. Um, participation, I think this is uh, something very important that, uh, this, uh, that the same opportunities should be given to all members at the university preventing discrimination against people and improving equal opportunities are top principles and this follows the Humboldt ideal of education and uh, that should um, that primarily through research and increasing, uh, increasingly promotes critical and independent thinking innovative driver of or driver of digital transformation within society uh, it's just um, some pictures to, um, to show, make visible connection, uh, the, the working together, collaboration together. Uh, also, students should take the opportunity during this course to work together and, and study together. Um, I think international, ancient internationality uh, is shown best by this course and um, research and innovation uh, will lead, um, well, uh, is, is, the, big, is, is the, the important field. Well, coming back to energy environment, that is our main, main topic this time. Um, well, we, we should, uh, researchers from various disciplines should work together and ask, uh, for, ask the following questions. How can new energy sources be developed? How is energy supplied? How can energy be stored? And, you, and used efficiently, one of the main topics still are not really uh, not solved, and how can technologies become more sustainable. Corporations, as we uh, do practice within this summer course, are essential for the results. And this is my final uh, slide. Um, digitalization in teaching and, and in administration a help to organize the implementation not only of uh, of the res of um, uh, not only of uh, um, expertise but of course of the results and help to uh, help to make them really visible and um, applicable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. I think we now got a really nice overview of what the two summer universities are going to be about. Um, we will stay now with the topic of sustainable architecture, but we will be diving further into it. And I would like to invite um, our next speaker, Karin Stielhoff, to the stage. Uh, sorry, I was already there. I'm Renate Hammer, of course, from the Institute of Building and Research and Innovation, who will give us a presentation and jump further into the topic. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor and it's really encouraging to see so many people from all over the world uh, trying to find sustainable solutions. Um, my contribution, yeah, I, I try to give you some ideas maybe about how to build within the boundaries of our planet. So why do I think it's clever to use this planetary boundaries framework? Because it's a, a global framework. You can use it anywhere and it shows our global uh, challenges very well. It, it's uh, quite a young framework. 
it has uh, been presented first in 2009, and maybe you know that by uh, Jon Röckström and Will Steffen, but there have been many more scientists uh, contributing to this framework. How does it work? Um, it shows three zones, the safe zone of operation uh, space for people and a resilient planet in the center. Then there comes a zone of uncertainty where we can react to the problems and can be quite sure that what we do will lead to a positive reaction and uh, finally the danger zone where there are many uncertainties and uh, it's unsafe and for me most important maybe it's unjust and has a high risk of planetary destabilization. The gray fields you see are fields where we still don't know what's going on, but we know that they are crucial. Because we look at nine uh, essential Earth system processes in this uh, framework, for instance, climate change and land system change, and you see there are clear defined uh, borderlines that shouldn't be stepped over if we want to stay safe. I don't want to go over all nine, this you can do while working. Um, the framework has uh, seen a development, a quick one, not so encouraging. Um, you see the first uh, in 2009 showed uh, three system processes out of the safe space. The next release in 2015 showed already four, and what we are working with actually shows uh, already six system processes out of safe space. So if we want to work, we have to work with this framework. For us as uh, builders, as architects, as planners, we can contribute to all nine processes, but here I just want to make a smaller um, angle because uh, here we have a really big leverage to work into the right direction and to contribute to a better uh, development. How does uh, building influence the CO2 emissions? Can we say something about uh, a common direction for all of the world? There has been a really interesting study just released, I think, last month, where there are some answers to this question. So the first is more built-up land claimed per capita and longer transport infrastructure per inhabitant land use um, leads anywhere in the world very direct and very clear and with high impact to higher CO2 emissions. So. These are the problems we have in common, and we have to find solutions very local. You know this all, global problem, local solution, even in building. And it would be for me very interesting to learn from all of you, from people who work with total different systems and total different um, um, surroundings than we have in Austria. But I'm just an expert here, so I show you one or the other experience from Austria. So here you can see reference values of um, residential building, user residential building for material in the first line, for the building operation in the second, and for the building introduced traffic in the third. If we do a really ambition building, then the emissions look like this in kilogram per usable floor space. And you see the total of 26.3 kilograms. If we compare to a new building, just according to the building codes, we see that uh, there is a tremendous surplus. And what we see also is that the really impact um, comes out of uh, the introduced traffic. So one of these uh, new buildings by building code is somewhere in the middle of the city and the second is on the periphery. 
our building stocks. So we have many, many, many existing buildings here, and you see uh, in the under four a not refurbished building, and under five a refurbished building. And you can see really um, quick win if we refurbish buildings, and you see at the total. The refurbished building, if it is in the city center, can even be as good as a new building, which is quite optimized. And now we can try to make some sceneries. Um, maybe we go on as uh, we are used to by not refurbishing and adding something on the periphery. So we add three and four, and this would sum up in nearly 100 uh, kilograms CO2 emissions per uh, square meter. Another scenario could be that we really with ambition try to brighten up the existing building stock and therefore can reduce building outside on the green meadow, so to say. And this could be what we reduce if you do so reduce from the business as usual scenario. So it's not a sink. Building as we do it actually is never a sink. So you see quick wins here and uh, we all know what we have to do. We have to optimize the building envelope. We have to design a thermal mass management and we have to decarbonize our HVAC systems. I show you one very fine example here in Austria um, in Linz on the Right hand side, the old building, on the left hand, a new enhanced building, establishing a new mixed use and ready to use for many more people than before. What I would like to discuss with you is if it's uh, still okay to uh, account the material input over 100 years, what is done in these calculations. Because we have to be climate neutral within the next 20 years. And if we just discount this, then our table here looks quite different. You see, new building uh, causes the same material input like the building operation of an existing building not refurbished. We really have to look closer on materials. So, is there space left in our existing building stock so we don't need, need to build new? Um, if we look, for instance, at Innsbruck, where we have an vacancy uh, monitoring, it shows that there are about 9% of the ready-to-use uh, flats are not rented. They could be rented like that, but since at least a half year, they are empty. So there is kind of reserve we really can look at. And what about vacant office and uh, commercial spaces? I can show you a super um, example. Maybe you want to go and look at it. It's a revitalization of a vacancy through conversion. So this was an old post office. And now it's uh, the so-called Altan Park, where more than 100 uh, flats have been established into the old structure. Another um, flowchart that would enhance the, the idea that we have really enough stock already is uh, this here from Austria from 2014. It shows something quite um, um, yeah, strange. We just put about 9% of our material back in a cycle. We throw away about 30%, but the rest we stock and add it to materials we already have, and that year by year. Is Austria a specific case here? We will see that later on. And, uh, yeah, maybe introduce the idea that we take, if not the stock itself, materials from the stock, like here, an example from Copenhagen, where the old Carlsberg brewery has been brought down, and the material of the outer walls 
became the facade of a new residential building. Yeah, have a look at the world. You see material re resource uptake, even here it's nearly the same like in Austria, we have about 9% recycling material. And where, and this is really crucial, does this material go to? It goes to a high amount to housing. What does it mean for the CO2 emissions? As long as we just uptake, the most emissions come from fossil fuels. If we look at the consumption, because of we have to use fossil fuels for making the product, we see really important are housing, mobility, and nutrition. At these three, we have to look. So if we don't use what's already there, what about uh, using renewables? We look at this. So you see that biomass production even causes massive emissions. But is this just because of agriculture or even on forestry? We see here the development of emissions and sinks out of wood production and forestry itself. And you see that we have really things here, and things from uh, replacing combustion of fossil fuels by wood or of um, emissive materials by wood in building, but we really have to look carefully on the way we treat our woods. And woods do have massive problems, as we can say, see here, a picture of Austria, because, again, of climate change. So, for sure, we have to use this wood, but we have to look after the wood soil and cover it as quick as possible with young, new, resilient trees. But climate change is not the only problem for the wood and the wood's soil. It's, we come to green water. It's uh, over-exploitation, for instance, by agriculture. And the second picture you see is even a picture of last summer in Austria. So we as builders have to give answers to how we can moisture up the, um, the earth we live on. So by redesigning public spaces and by redesigning building envelopes, make them store water. We decide if streets look like this or look like this. In Obergrafendorf, a little uh, village in Austria, even the sewer system could be replaced by natural draining that way. And for sure, on the right-hand side, we have zero biodiversity, and at the left-hand side, we have at least a chance for biodiversity. What leads us finally back to the longer transport infrastructures bear inhabited land unit? Here in Austria, many facilities needed frequently have, because it was that easy, been moved to the outskirts. Thus, we have functions separated and commuting necessary. And what we can, can you see in the centers enlarging, so a combination of problems. To address, address this, this is a process. You need to involve people to start changing with them together. Ask them what they want. You can't tell them you don't should commute. You have to ask what do you want, and this is a, a responsibility of, ours, of us as planners. The people here wanted uh, a park, additional in their uh, town, and they wanted to improve their main Square, it was from Leiden. In theory, you could see here, not only shops are added, uh, added here, it's a day nursery, it's assistant living, it's a bakery, and many, many common activities. Which brings us back to the common thing, the common future, and you see here just five suggestions what we can do about our common future as architects and planners. Thank you.
for our next presentation. I'm very grateful that uh, you've already heard about the planetary boundary layers. So all I have to talk now about is a good life. Um, personally, I have um, about 75 years of a good life. I'm very privileged in this. Um, yes, it's true. The, for the first years of my life, scarcity was a problem in Austria. Um, there was not enough food. Nevertheless, I didn't realize because I was still too young. From the time I can remember, thank you very much. From the time I can remember, I've really had a good life. Um, yes, we did have, um, we were taught to take care of our things, of our clothes, of our toys. Our clothes were passed on from the elders, elders to, the, to the elder uh, brothers and sisters, to the younger brothers and sisters. Um, and if something went, uh, something, um, well, uh, went out of, uh, out of work, uh, we tried to repair it. My parents were very handy at that. Um, yeah, and this has gone on. It's really been a good life. But if we look at the, yeah. mm -hmm. if we look at the energy that was used um, during my lifetime, yeah, if I can go on here, maybe I'll find, I can do this here. It seems stuck. Ah, well, you're seeing something different from me, which makes it a bit difficult. Well, if we look at the energy that, that, uh, that was used the world over during those 75 years almost, we see that there was exponential growth of this, of this energy uh, use. And um, scientists tell us that if we try to stay within those uh, boundaries, those uh, uh, planetary boundaries, especially if we try to stay within the 1.5 degrees limit, we need that within the 1.5 degree limit of, of um, um, the Paris Agreement, then the amount of energy that will be available will be about half as much as we have now. So, um, yeah, looking back, when did we have half as much energy as we had now? That was about 1978. Uh, and I can assure you, 1978 was quite a good life. Uh, it was not something that I would be afraid to go back on. I think there's some things which uh, have improved since then and which we can use. Uh, we don't have to really go back. Uh, but it's not as though uh, what we need to do in order to meet the climate challenge is, um, uh, well, uh, make do without, without most things. So let's see whether it works now. Yeah, you can see the energy now, the energy curve. Uh, this dramatic increase, um, especially since the 1950s, and um, yeah, 50% of what we have now, and I took the year 2019, because uh, Corona after that sort of uh, made a dent, which is probably not structural. So that gives us, that takes us to about 1978. Uh, even if we go back to the time of birth, uh, my birth, that was about 16% uh, of what we have now, and even that time was not really bad. Um, now, if we look at the world, maybe that's the wrong uh, metrics to look at. Maybe we should look at Austria. Uh, and if I look at Austria, well, uh, these 50% uh, take me back to about 1960. And uh, well, that was when I started studying at this university, well, a bit before that. Uh, and um, that wasn't a bad time either. We traveled, we, we, we had education, we had amusements. Uh, uh, the world was great. In fact, it was so great, we were sure that it would become better and better and better benefits. We will probably be healthier and possibly live longer. Why? Because we will be doing more on foot, bicycling, 
taking public transport instead of just sitting in cars, moving around. And by not sitting in cars, we will also have cleaner air, less noise. So a lot of benefits just from change in the mobility system. But there's also benefits from a change in the, in the food system. Uh, if we eat less meat uh, and uh, food from, uh, from organic farming, uh, then we will be healthier because we will not take in a lot of those um, ads to the food that really do not belong into our body. Uh, and less meat is also something every, medi medi um, every physician tells us would be uh, helpful, at least if your, um, your, your nutrition resembles the average Austrian nutrition. Um, you can see I'm talking about Austria and I'm talking about Europe and probably about the other industrialized nations. I'm not talking about the third world. Um, we will probably have more comfortable buildings. We heard a little bit about that already by now. And they will cost less to operate. Um, we'll be more resilient. We will not be so dependent on imports. We will not be so dependent on uh, technologies. Uh, we heard something about digitalization and I, uh, I'm always a bit hesitant there because I think uh, in the si situation we're in now we really have to make sure that we're resilient and the more we make ourselves dependent on digitalization the less resilient we'll become. So I think there's, a, there's an, an optimization problem there. Uh, but overall with um, um, products being produced closer by because we don't want those huge transports, fewer products, maybe products that are less processed, more, more ability to repair. We've lost some of that ability, but we will regain it. Uh, that will make us, all of that will make us more resilient. We will also live in a fairer world because if we look back, uh, the, the gap between rich and poor countries and between rich and poor people has grown over those last seven decades. Um, so if um, we stop this, this um, economy of growth and this financial system of compound interest, uh, then we will, uh, we will see that this, uh, this gap closes again. And that will make for a more peaceful world. Uh, just to, to show you this, this, uh, uh, this development in inequality, um, you can see this here starting in 1915 and how rapidly it has grown over the last decades and this is something we need to change and which we can change in the process of achieving one and a half degrees. And if we look at the, at the doomsday clock, a, an invention by the atomic physicists um, that tried to estimate how close are we to doomsday and um, if we go back in time here we can see those dates I mentioned so far, about um, 1960 and 65 and um, 1978, uh, in both of those, uh, that period, we were farther away from doomsday than we are now. We are now at 90 seconds to doomsday and we've never been as close before. And that has very much to do, I'm quite convinced that has very much to do with limits to growth and that we have in fact reached those limits. Uh, and this has repercussions on all the aspects of our life. Um, before I show you a, a slide which goes to, uh, well, sort of not prove, but give an indication that this might be true, uh, just uh, the, the, an, an, a glance at the food system. Um, we are using about uh, the, of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the, the space we have on our globe on land, that's about <coughs> just about 30%, the rest is water. And we're not treating water well anyway, but uh, those 20, 30 percent, 71 percent of those are, um, are um, inhabitable land. And of the inhabitable land, about uh, 50 percent is agricultural land. And of those 50 percent agricultural land, we're using 77 percent to produce feed for uh, meat production, for, for animals that uh, we then want to eat. Uh, and this meat production, or the meat that we are eating, only provides 33% of our proteins and 17% of our calories. So we're using an enormous amount of space uh, for comparatively little nutrition. Uh, and that is not very sensible in a world with increasing population and where space is probably one of the very limiting 
um, uh, uh, resources we have. And um, you already saw this picture, I think, uh, while we were trying to get the, the, the thing working. Uh, this is a family in Chad um, that has been invited to, uh, to spread out before them what they eat within a week. It's part of a book called The Hungry Planet. And um, what you can see is that they have some grains and some, some vegetables, a little bit of fruit and a lot of water can, uh, because it's a very dry area. And if you compare that to what a family, a similar family in Germany spreads out before itself uh, about what they eat during one week, um, well, you can see a huge difference if you can really make it out. Uh, I found it not so easy to, to uh, uh, depict things on the screen. But it's an enormous variety. It's much more than the other family has. And uh, uh, there's uh, quite a bit of meat. And you can see the child family has practically no meat. Um, this difference is not due to physiological differences between people in Chad and people in Austria or Germany. Uh, this has something to do with our way of living, with our style of living. And I think we can only profit by um, reducing our, um, our abundance and um, uh, living closer to what uh, people in Chad have and maybe give, have, give them a chance to have a bit more variety and a bit more food. Um, so I think um, reducing this being a bit more sufficient uh, is not something uh, that is scary, but uh, in fact, I don't know about you, but if I go to a shop I'm not used to and I stand in front of, um, I don't know, 15 different types of yogurt uh, or five different types of butter, I'm just um, overwhelmed and I don't really know what to buy. I appreciate much more if there's just a few things that I can choose from and I know that they are good. So, um, why do I say limits to growth are possibly already reached? You can see here the Human Development Index um, for a number of countries, um, rather uh, by chance. Uh, and you can see that this Human Development Index, which is supposed to be an index for how, how well we are doing, uh, how, 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 how socially uh, acceptable our societies are. You can see that this Human Development Index grew and it started growing much earlier than this graph begins. And it grew for practically all the nations until about 2016, 2017, 18 maybe. And since then it's become rather flat. Uh, and the question is, uh, why has it become flat? Uh, it, are we not, are societies not getting uh, more? Uh, are they not, are they not, do they not have an improvement? Can they not uh, uh, improve in their, in their social uh, well-being? And I think this could be an indication that in fact we are at the limits to growth. We have so far, uh, if we had a problem with one resource, we could help ourselves by uh, increasing another resource. For instance, if the land became less fertile, we introduced chemical uh, support to increase our food production. But there's limits to that. And at, the, at this point, we might be at a, at a situation where we can no longer a, a, a substitute some, one resource by another resource because all resources are reaching their limits. And um, in fact, in a globalized world, uh, these limits will probably reach, be reached at the same time all over the world. So we can also not use geographical uh, differences to, to resolve that problem. Um, so even without uh, the necessity to do something against climate change, I think we need a full transformation of our way of doing business, of our economy. This is something Angela Merkel said when she visited the, the Ahrtal, which uh, experienced this um, terrible flood in 2021. Uh, that was shortly before she uh, retired as chancellor. And she said, we really need a full transformation of our way of doing business. And you can discuss this through all the different aspects of our, our economy. The energy part is, think, is rather obvious. The industry is also rather obvious. We need more durable products and uh, 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 possibility to repair. And most likely, we don't need as much ownership. We can rent things. So there's a lot of things we can change. And all of them can be changed for the better. I don't want to go all of, through all of this, but I do want 
to show, uh, to, to point out that at the end we have this economic system, we have the financial system, both of them really need changes, and this also means we have to think about democracy. Uh, how, can, how can we achieve all these changes in a democratic system and how, how do democ democracies or democracy need to, to evolve in order to handle the challenges we are meeting? And um, as a final slide, I just want to cite um, uh, Laudato Si, the encyclica by by Pope Franciscus, not because I'm a religious person, I'm not, uh, but by, because I think it's so very right what he says. He says ecological culture cannot be reduced to a series of urgent and partial responses to immediate problems of pollution, environmental decay, and the depletion of natural resources. There needs to be a distinctive way of looking at things, a way of thinking, policies, an educational program, a lifestyle, and a spirituality which together generate resistance to the assault of the technocratic paradigm. Otherwise, even the best ecological initiatives can find themselves caught up in the same globalized logic. So I invite you all to join in changing our thinking, uh, finding new ways of thinking, finding ways of thinking as our, of ourselves as part of nature and not of uh, the species dominating nature because we're all dependent on nature for our survival. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. And I want you to, um, to introduce you to Annika Dafert. Um, she is a founder of Writers for Future in Salzburg and is going to tell us a bit of how to motivate people to get these changes um, implemented. Thank you and good evening to everyone. My name is Annika Dafert. I'm 21 years old and a climate activist. I'm currently a student at Buki Vienna and finishing my bachelor's degree in environment and bioresource management. When I was 16, I went to my first ever protest. It was the first Fridays for Future strike in Salzburg and it actually was organized by my family and I. This was four and a half years ago. Four and a half years ago, the climate justice movement has started. Just under four years ago, it had the biggest momentum with the big global strikes in September 2019. And now, four years later, the global average temperature last week was the hottest ever recorded. According to the World Meteorological Organization, the phenomenon El Nino, which is only starting now, paired with the human-induced um, greenhouse gas effect is expected to break even more records in the next years. Okay. <laughs> and yet, the governments all over the world are not treating the climate crisis as a crisis. Yet, s people still believe that the climate, climate activists should go to jail for raising awareness. And yet, last week I had an encounter with a climate change denier and she, think, still, and she still thinks not believing in the climate crisis is an opinion. I was thinking about telling this story and I decided to do it because I couldn't stop thinking about it. The thing with these people is that you cannot change their opinion with scientific facts because they believe that these facts are wrong and neither with the things that they see before their eyes because they just say that it has always been this way. So when I said, here's a graph where you can see the development of the global temperature, she would just say, it's normal that it's getting hotter. And when I counter that, it has never changed in this speed. She just asked how I would know that. And then again, when I explained the scientific facts, she says that she's read somewhere that some scientists think that it's different and that all the other scientists are wrong. Even though most of the scientists agree, she believes the couple that don't. And when I asked her, because she's living in the Alps, where ski tourism is, and winter tourism is still the most important source of income for a lot of people, she 
if she sees, if she doesn't see how we get less and less snow these years, she says it's always been like that, that we get less snow one year and more snow the next. As the time went on, I went to describe how the future can look like if we just continue doing what we're doing. I talked about people dying, floods, fleeing their un uninhabitable homes, knowing that there's a part of the world's population that has more fault to these cat catastrophes than others. And I talked how I, how, about how I don't know if this all will happen peacefully. And in the end, the only thing she had to say was, well, if you're right, then we just, just enjoy our life now, shouldn't we? I actually regretted starting the, con the discussion at this point. It was so incredibly frustrating that I, being a climate activist for so many years, studying this specific subject at university, couldn't convince a grown woman with scientific facts. On the other hand, she doesn't believe in science and facts. And right after, I was really angry. How should we try to save the world if some people don't even see the problem? What if she, being also a friend of my boss, will go to her and complain about me and my discussions? But then again, I couldn't have just let her keep talking without countering with facts. I have learned to stand up for climate justice. So right now, I'm proud that I did it. And I encourage you all to do the same, whenever you feel like having the enough resources to do it. Luckily, not all people are these hardcore climate crisis deniers, but the majority just doesn't seem to care enough. But on the other hand, most climate actions like most actions against the climate crisis, need support from the people, from as many people as possible. So how do we explain to those people who think they have to give up their good life that they think they have now in order to combat the climate crisis? People are slowly starting to realize that something's not quite right, that something's changing, that heat waves that are not normal are not only annoying, and kind of exhausting, but also deadly. But in Austria, still people want to drive their car at 130 kilometers per hour than just 100 kilometers per hour. Oblivious to the consequences that people in other parts of the world already have to face, droughts, weather catast catastrophes, floods, death. If we all become climate activists, in the sense of talking to other people, to, many, to as many people as possible, we can all make a change. Climate activism is not only being on the streets or going to the global climate strikes, it's also having uncomfortable con conversations with people. I know how uncomfortable it can be to talk to family members or friends about the climate crisis, but it can change so much. Another person being aware of the crisis is one more person supporting climate action. I know what I'd be thinking right now if I heard this speech. Why do we do have, have to do the work? What about politicians? Why don't they do the work? For God's sake. It's true. Politicians have to do their work. They should pass climate protection laws. They should ban cars from cities. They should stop listening to the fossil fuel lobby. That's what we tell them on our strikes. But you and I can't pass laws. We can talk to people and try to get acceptance for the laws and for the actions. I often get asked what people can do, which personal changes I would recommend, and instead of saying, eat less meat, fly less, and take public transport, I say, change your electricity provider to a green one, go to climate strikes, and talk to people about the climate crisis. The first one is normally just a phone call. The second one takes a couple of hours, twice a year. And the last one can change the mindset of a whole population. And that's what we need. We need people who want real climate action, who demand climate action. My grandma, for example, was a bit annoyed that my family and I were going to the strikes, organizing them, and also bringing the subject up on the lunch table. 
But now she gets called by her friends whenever she sees interviews or speeches from me. And she said she'll start a petition for her house so that the lawn doesn't get mowed every single week because it's, completely, it's a complete waste, bad for the environment and bad for the animals there. Her words. Through talking to her in the past couple of years, she has actually now found that she has a voice and she can use, use it and she can stand up for, for herself. And that's what we need people to know. We know that protesting can change things. The biggest accomplishments in history have been reached with protests. Women's right, women's right to vote, the abolishment of legal racial segregation, and many more. But to motivate people to take a stand, they have to be hopeful. Coming back to the conversation with this climate change denier I had last week, the explanation about what the future will look like if we don't act is really not a good way to motivate people. It isn't something to start a conversation about climate action with. On the contrary, I, I tell people about the things we can gain from climate action. Things people know will change their life for the better. If we have renewable energy, we're not dependent on other countries' oil and gas prices anymore. If we ban cars from the cities, they'll be more spacious and welcoming to walk through. If we plant trees, the air will be better to breathe and cooler. And of course, we cannot keep living our lives and doing, and doing the same as we do now to some extent. But we can make a change for, for the better. Humans are not known to be the biggest fans of change. But we have to eventually, sooner or later, the thing is, the sooner we take actual climate action, the more we can control the consequences. And that's what we can tell people. And if any, everyone who vaguely believes in science can agree to some level, we can change something. Talking can change something. I encourage you all to take the step and have these conversations. And if you already do, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. With this, we go into a break. There is coffee and cake next door. For the organizing teams, please don't run away yet. We will do group photos here, um, here in front. Please come, please come to the front. Um, for those of you who are joining us via the live stream, there is also an opportunity to network in 101 rooms. Um, you can find this when you go to um, the menu bar on the left. Um, there, you can also find a small expo with all of the sponsors. Um, we'll be back in half an hour. Enjoy the coffee and cake. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the break. Um, 
We'll now, now go further, deeper into the main topic of tonight and also start a, a more interactive conversation with you. Um, so like the main question is, um, how can we achieve a good life for everyone without exhausting um, the, the planet that we live on? Um, I will ask um, some questions myself and then I will open um, the floor, take questions from you and also from Slido. Um, the, the link to Slido and the QR code you can see. Um, can you see it there? No. Could we put it in? The link. No. Um, so now here you can find the link that you can put in questions um, if you prefer writing, otherwise there will be mics going around. Um, and um, yeah, please don't be shy to ask anything. I think it's so wonderful that we have such an international crowd today. And um, until now, the discussion was very um, Europe focused and, and maybe there are insights that you want to share um, from other regions um, and, and questions um, that haven't been addressed yet. Um, since it's a global response, um, let's use this. Um, so one of my, my first question would be, um, that the, in the core of talking about planetary boundaries, there is, um, there is growth, there is our economic system. Um, how, how to go forward? This is a system that we, that is so, that we live in, that our structures are so deeply ingrained with. Um, how would we go forward? Yes, well, I think um, <clears throat> I don't have the answer, <clears throat> but one part of it certainly is that we understand the system in order to know where the leverage points are, where we can change things. Uh, I think to a certain extent we will have to build up um, parallel systems that work in a different manner, uh, like for instance the economy of the common good, uh, to, to have a different type of balance sheet, and you can, you can uh, use both. Uh, and uh, if many people use both, then it's, it will be easier to switch from f and, and, uh, and stop using, using our present uh, um, um, euro-centered or money-centered balance sheets. Um, I think that, well, let's put it the other way. I don't, think, I don't see a revolution coming. So what we really have mm. to do is take small steps. Uh, Günther said if people understand the, the financial system, then there will be a revolution tomorrow. I'm afraid not. Um, <laughs> at least not, people won't know fast enough. Uh, but, um, but I think it's necessary to, to, to understand it so steps can be taken for change. And I think with every step towards change, um, more steps will follow. So mm. I think it's a, it's a, it's a process. And I think we're also already seeing some of this. For instance, the taxonomy, the European taxonomy, is a step in the right direction. Yes, there's the problem that nuclear is, is, is sustainable and gas is sustainable. OK, there's a lot of problems. But I, can, I, I know from my experience of talking to bankers and to insurances that they are that really makes a difference to them, that they have to look at these, mm -hmm. at these issues. So I think change is happening, um, maybe not fast enough. We can try to speed it up. We have to try to speed it up. But I think it's a stepwise process. So we're speaking about a good life. Um, you have laid out in your presentation before what you understand in your, of a good life. Do you want to add to this? Um, how, do you, how, would you address, how would you, what is the first thing that you think of when you think of a good life within the planetary boundaries? Or maybe starting with, um, with you, what, is, what would be the first thing that you think of? Well, one thing that came to my mind listening to this now is how past generations always thought about their children um, living in a better world. Um, I mean, my grandparents worked to have their kids living in a better world and my parents tried to make my world a better world. So I think we're now at a changing point where maybe there's no growth to another world, but maybe like it, it stagnates a little bit and we take a small step back and see we already have a pretty good world where we're at. I'm not in the whole world, definitely not, but this, this thing of creating a better world for the next generation should be, is so ingrained in, in so many people's minds that we should also take that into consideration as well. Like, um, a good wo world for all has been like the goal of so many generations before us. Why do we have to like, 
how do we have to change our minds to accommodate a good world for everyone now? That's what I'm... Maybe I can, if, if you allow. Uh, I think that's right, but I think what we... Uh, we have sort of lost um, the orientation of what is a good world, what is a good life. Uh, we have started to think that a good life depends on what we have uh, and, uh, and about standard of living rather than quality of life. And in that sense, I think it's a step back. Uh, mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I think it would be a step forward if we get back to, back to a quali quality of life. And quality of life, uh, making use of the advances that were there. That, I mean, I don't think we want to stop using washing machines. Uh, <laughs> It would be a lot of work to, to start washing by hand again. So I think uh, make use of what can be taken along, but um, change our view of what is good life. And uh, good life in the sense of quality, quality of life, and I think that is something that is really, that you can work for for the coming generations, and that's really worth working for. Do you want to add to this? Well, may, uh, maybe I, I try to add the perspective of um, someone really working on, on hands-on, on buildings, and what, what we see in the moment is that, that there is a, a crisis on the market, on the building market, so we don't uh, have a lot to do, but we have tremendous work by changing the system. And in the moment, I see there is, in fact, the crisis is a chance because there are, there are many clients saying what to do now, and this is the first step to, to change. Before, as long as the system was running, you could talk a lot about change, but nobody was interested because the thing went fine and uh, building new was, was uh, worth it and you can um, earn a lot of money in the moment. You can't earn so much money in the business. And this, this gives way to, to new ideas and uh, maybe one one example we have a, a very beautiful lake in the south of Austria with many many buildings on the lake side so there is one um, village that said so for two years we don't build because otherwise the whole lakeside will be stuck of buildings and within these two years there were alternatives and new ways of having a good life without this idea of more and more and more and more because there is no space left. So, in fact, there was no space left. So what to do if nothing is left? Take a break. And now we have, we have a break and uh, maybe we can find now new, better ideas in and this what, break. And what were these alternatives in this case? Um, what, a little bit what I, what I tried to, to uh, show in my presentation, work with what's already there. There is so much reserve in, in what we already built. Uh, don't, uh, it's, it's an Austrian perspective. I, I really don't know how it's in the rest of the world. For, for Europe, you can really say that Europe is built. And we have to improve the stock. We have to make it better. We have so much knowledge now from, from new building. We have to bring this back to what we have. And so many things are empty. So use what's there and maybe in, in, in ideas about changing of economy, we have to, to focus labor instead of material. And this is, in, in the moment, material is that cheap or has been that cheap and labor has been so expensive. And me, I, I'm an architect, but I would join in here because <laughs> I want to know how to, how to change this idea that labor is expensive and material is cheap, what leads to, to this growth idea. You know, I think, I think we need a certain cultural change in this respect too. Uh, in, in Europe, at least in Austria, and I think in Germany as well, um, you're very attached to the building you live in. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who are born in one building and they live in the building until they die. And, um, uh, and throughout your life, you have different phases. You have phases where you need a lot of space and you have phases where you really don't need much space. And uh, other cultures like the, in the United States are completely different. Uh, you look for the building that suits your specific position in life at the moment. And I know from my own larger family, um, 
at the time when children are growing up, then they put on an extra story on the building. Uh, but that is only uh, being used for two years after that students, le uh, the children leave because they go to study somewhere else and then the thing is empty. So it's not just buildings or flats that are completely empty, it's also too much space for the individual. And mm -hmm. I think this, this is not something you can, you can order, or, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think we do need a cultural change in the direction that um, we should try to live in, in, in a situation which is um, adapted to, to stage in life. Uh, and I think that will take some time, but I think we should be working toward that, and I don't see anything in that direction. That's a nice point to ask if there's any questions already. Anyone? We totally if, confused you. <laughs> <laughs> if not, we can take one. Yes, there's a question. Here's a question. In fact, I do not have a question, but um, my experience is that young women with young children, they really do think differently about the world, about the future. And I have the experience that friends who do not have children in my age, for them, it's t they don't care about uh, the future at all. So that's uh, really uh, fascinating. Do you have any statistics? How many people, how many women have children? <laughs> because that would be interesting. <laughs> Maybe we take a question from Slido. So that... Hello, yeah. There's one question by Dagmar Riedl. How can existing buildings be better acknowledged as a resource instead of pulling them down or building new ones, what isn't ecologically or economically? I think that's a question for you. Yeah, we're trying to do that. And, and this is uh, one thing I, I really see the chance in, in the moment. Yeah? We, many, many people desire to have their own house, to have their own home, and we go there and say, Look, here is an empty house. I'm, I have the, the really great opportunity to live in a house from 1920, which is renovated. This one is empty, this one is empty. There is a functional emptiness there and there. So if you don't have the money yeah, anymore to buy a house or just to keep it empty, there comes, I, I see that there, even in my settlement, there comes a movement. Suddenly there are houses maybe maybe sell this house, maybe look at this house. So there, there, this, this crisis this, uh, of, of uh, the stock, I think, is a chance. And uh, what we need to make this attractive are examples, build examples. Um, yeah, and, and old houses can be so, so livable and so attractive. And for me, a really interesting question is uh, how to make them resilient for, for climate change, that's what they often are not, and in, in technical reasons, more heating, more cooling, how long heating anymore, when start cooling, and, and the, the, the level of, of technical um, input we have to do. So what is, what is low-tech? PV is not low-tech, but I think PV is really necessary. So this, this is for me really a, a point I would Love to hear your, your ideas in three weeks. But I think there are ideas around, like for instance, raising taxes on houses that are not being used. Just like you, you raise taxes on, on, on pieces of ground that are, that are dedicated to buildings and are not being built on in, in, mm. the, in, in the centers of towns. So I think you could raise taxes. You could, you could also make taxes dependent on how many people live in flat. Uh, compared to the size of the flat. So I think there's, there's fiscal method, methods you could use uh, to, to, to induce people to move um, and also to open it up to others. 
And um, I think it's also a matter of education. I think it's also a matter of educating the architect. Uh, uh, I, I remember um, I talked it was many years ago to an organization of, of plumbers. Um, and at that time, uh, fossil fuel was the norm. And um, that group had decided that they would not install any new uh, heating system or anything with fossil fuels. That meant that they would forego some of the income, uh, but they wanted to change. And I think in that sense, architects should also, whenever somebody asks them to do something for them, ask the right questions. Do you really need it? Does it have to be here? Does it have to be that big? And so on. And maybe some of the, some of the solution is also that the, the uh, I don't know whether I'm right there, but as far as I understand, the, the fee architects get uh, is, is in proportion to the cost of the whole building. So uh, architects are interested in having big buildings, costly buildings. Uh, that all of that induces the wrong, gives the wrong, the wrong, the wrong um, uh, signals. And I think so. There's there's many angles where where we could start. I believe. Mm -hmm. I think this I is have one what you ad additional suggestions because so many teachers are here. Um, I'm, I'm teaching on a on a univer or two, two universities, um, and I, I would really love to introduce the idea that we start with the first, second, third terms by doing design programs on renovation. And always when I when I suggest this, so the the students are mm, oh, mm, maybe. But the colleagues say they, they have to learn how to do it, then they can do renovation. Maybe we turn it around. Maybe they learn by renovating an old house much more about how architecture works. And then, in the end, maybe you can do one or the other design on the green lawn. But, but I would really like to, to try to turn the idea around. I don't have any background in architecture. How does the what is the typical reaction that you get when you propose this? From the students? From the students or from your colleagues? From the students, they, they think, it, think about it, yeah? The colleagues are often of the, of the, have the idea that you, you learn architecture by starting by zero, yeah? And, and establish on, on the green lawn. And I would really, maybe I'm totally wrong, yeah? But, but I would like to, to start this uh, experiment with giving them something built and, and look what they do out of it, because this would switch the idea of architecture. As there is many teachers in the, in the room that she addressed, who is there any reactions, anyone who wants to, to respond to this? We do this next year. <laughs> Here's one colleague. Please. <laughs> the mic, please. Michael? Yeah. Martin, Karen. Sorry, my voice is too uh, not loud enough. <laughs> well, um, besides, we do quite a lot yeah. of renovation, uh, always, also in the, in the past. But at the moment, we have a very interesting module dealing with building with earth and clay. Ah, and right. one of mm -hmm. the topics oh, is, is to renovate um, uh, historic clay buildings close to Vienna in, the, in lower, lower Austria. And I learned that much dealing with that, I myself, because you have to, every layer is important and it's uh, real buildings. And the, in, the inhabitants, if, if you don't, um, if you don't uh, renovate them in the right way, they will have big problems. There will be, uh, there will be uh, humidity, the, the, the clay will, uh, will not melt, but they will, it will be ruined. So mm. I think, uh, and the students are very, very interested. They like it, yeah? They like I it very much. Like it, yeah. mm. <coughs> I can respond. Uh, we have um, two courses in our master's program. One is uh, dealing with uh, refurbishment uh, in a design program from this semester, from the next semester on. Uh, and the second is integrated design, where we did it the last two, three, four years. 
in, in different programs where we also had this uh, term or this, this theme of, of refurbishment or addition. So yeah. we, uh, to, to have a higher density. As you might know, this, uh, there is a uh, regular student trophy, the Pro Holtz student trophy, and they also changed uh, from building on the green, of the green lawn to, to, uh, uh, to densify the, the towns or mm. whatever, the, the uh, quarters. And um, I think this is in many programs and I hope that it will be also on, on the biggest, bigger university, the TU Wien, that they follow those programs. But the problem is you need a lot of skills, so it's not I think it's not okay to start in a mm. bachelor's program because they have to learn how to design and they have to learn the, the, the basic programs. And, uh, and, and refurbishment is the highest level, I think, because you have to, to understand how this old building is working and you have to understand how much you can mm. put, pull out of this building and how, how, how much you can add. So you, you need much more knowledge about statics and all those things and about the materials. And so it's okay in a, in a master's program, but in a bachelor's program, I would not do that mm. because it's too, too early to, uh, and, and uh, it's uh, doing the, the strife um, uh, in, in the juniors programs, you, you, have, you have to be a senior. Strife is a, um, a, a downhill down race, everybody downhill knows in Austria. <laughs> skiing, skiing slope. I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, Thank I'm not you. sure. <laughs> maybe but we can. Maybe we make an experiment. <laughs> maybe we go. Uh, maybe that's one for you, Annika. You want to add something before? Just say something. Um, there was a real revolution in physics teaching when Feynman uh, decided to start with relativity theory and quantum physics rather than mechanics and so on. So uh, I think it's doable. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not an architect, but uh, I think, I think it would be worth a try. Revolutionary maybe once. approaches are worth it. Okay, trying. let's come back. Um, <laughs> Annika, maybe that's one for you. Um, what do you think um, we can do to combat the rise of climate skepticism? especially the type that is heavily related to populism? I think that's a really good question because I think it's very, um, you, can, you can really see it in, in also almost the whole of Europe um, with kind of a shift to a more right um, parties in our democracies. I think that's also related to that. And I think it's ingrained in a, in a deeper thing when people are talking about science. Um, I feel like I, I read an, in, an interview about how, why people are voting for right-wing parties and there are also some of the people that are climate crisis skeptics that are just, just have the feeling that the politicians and what they talk about don't really reach them or understand their situations in life. I don't think that they um, inherently are skeptic about the climate crisis or the climate change that we have going on because they probably see it in their lives. But there's a bit skeptical about how people are talking about it and maybe not really also understanding everything of it. So to combat that, um, try to educate people on an eye to eye level not talking down like we have this crisis and taking really scientific words and using complicated language to explain it, but maybe try to, take, try to explain to people um, with more compassion, more, more uh, I don't know how to, how to really explain it, but I hope you, you understand my point to just not do it like a top-down discussion. Sorry, really, <laughs> this um, um, Yeah, to just meet people where they stand and try to educate them, because I think it's not a problem about them not trying to understand, but not like how they're talked to. I can see the sliders here. I can just read them out. Ah, yeah, okay. okay, may, I, um, may I just add something to that? I'm sorry I'm adding to everything, but I think a discussion should be a discussion. I, so. yeah. no, really go for it. Um, I think one, one, one aspect that is um, maybe important is also giving a good example. 
And if you're mm. willing, we can do a little experiment here, right here and now. Uh, some of you probably know it, but uh, maybe it's helpful to others. So I would ask you to uh, clap your hands <laughs> once, uh, very strongly, very loudly, and all together. Yeah? I will give you this, the signal. Yeah? So uh, get your hands ready if you're willing to join us. Uh, and uh, the, the task is to clap once uh, like a good orchestra all at once. And I will give the signal. I will count to three. And when I say now, you clap. OK? So are you ready? I will, talk to th I will count to three. And when I say now, you clap. OK, so one, two, three, now. <laughs> what you do, and because I clapped, you also clapped, what, what you do is much more important than what you say. So if you give a good example and um, uh, live a, a sustainable and climate-friendly life, you don't really have to talk very much. Um, I mean, of course, I also talk a lot, so, uh, but, but doing it is really the important thing. You can also see that at, at, at crossings, road crossings. Uh, when, the, when the signal is on red, everybody stands there, and, and then somebody starts walking, and everybody else also walks. Uh, mm -hmm. So the example is something very, very important. You can talk about the example as well. Thank you. Maybe the example is something for the next um, question, too. Um, the, ah, it's not on the, on the screen anymore, um, Clara. The, there was a question about um, speeding up the, the um, and renovation of, of buildings from yeah. currently 1%. Yeah. And Hello. How can we speed up and upscale energy renovations? Management and incentives are needed, and there's also Another question related to that. Residential buildings with multiple homeowners face huge barriers for energy renovations. How can we ease the complexity of renovating those buildings? How to speed up the, the, building, the building revolution? Yeah, this is a super um, complex question. So what we, what we see is always a combination um, out of uh, economic questions and the question of, of law. And there is in, in Austria very much this conflict, who gives the money and who has uh, higher comfort and, and less to pay for, for heating and cooling. And as long as this dilemma is not uh, really broken up, it, it will stay difficult. And what, what we try to do is do as much as we can with the ones who are able and willing just to bring these good examples down to, to make them seeable for everybody that it is possible and that it does uh, help at least uh, in, in the end uh, everybody. But it's, it's, um, for me it's logic that we have many, many um, contradictionary um, regulations to to really renovating buildings. What, for example? Yeah, what I tried to explain. The one who owns the house has to bring in all the money, yeah. and the one who lives in has the benefits. So there is really a problem of this spending money and having the benefits. This is a dilemma we really have, and it's within the, the building laws. So we have to look at these laws and look how we can improve the situation that it is not only spending the money of the owner of the house for, in fact, for him, no, no benefit. And there are different uh, solutions um, discussed, but for sure you can see that there is, there is um, a an, an con uh, conflict of interest on, on a very high and very political level in, in this case. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, my, my, my only suggestion is do where it's possible to have the good example and this, use this as a teaser mm -hmm. and talk to politicians for, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, maybe to bring the discussion also out of Europe, are there any um, examples from other parts of the world, from other continents that you would like to bring in? 
Otherwise, there was a question back there, I think. Thank you. I have a question, uh, architect architecture-related question, and I'm, I have no experience in architecture, but I have a feeling that the, the Altbauten, the old buildings that are 100 years or even older, they seem to be built for a longer period of time than uh, new buildings. So I live in uh, Nordbauviertel, and I love it. I can only recommend it uh, to visit. Um, and, but I think the new buildings, they look like they will only last maybe 50 years. And the facades are already breaking down after five or 10 years. So I want to know, is this just my feeling or is there some truth to that? Well, the, you, have, you have to um, differentiate. There are two um, economic models of of residential in the, mo uh, in the moment we have in Austria. One, focus on renting itself. This works more or less good and leads to more or less good qualities. And the, one, the other is using residential as um, a product on the financial market. And then it's not important if this is good or rentable or whatever, it's a part of a financial product. And you buy it and you sell it and you buy it and you sell it and the last one who couldn't sell it anymore has a problem. Yeah? So we see these, these two ways of building and I think it is really necessary to look at residential buildings as, as a, a basic right and basic rights shouldn't be talked on the stock markets. Basic rights, maybe we take this question from Slido as next, which is um, how to overcome the fear of sufficiency. Well, I think, I think just by trying it out, <laughs> I think it's, 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 uh, um, it's really a burden all of these things we have, we collect in the course of our lives. Uh, and um, I mean, buildings used to burn down and you started anew and you got rid of all the things you had, you, you had collected. And I think this, uh, to understand that having things is, is a burden would help to make, to, to, to get people to understand that having less is, uh, is, uh, makes life lighter and easier. Um, I, I think you just need, yeah, examples. Um, uh, of course, it's also an, an, a question of education and of talking about those things. Uh, and, and behind all of it is, of course, an economy that wants to grow. And in an economy that wants to grow and needs to grow in order to be stable, will continuously try to sell you something. Uh, making this, this making the, our way of life consumerism by, by buying more and more and more uh, that has been that has been um, preached for so long it's part of our thinking and if we were talking about reorganizing um, the, the the architecture courses I think we need to do so much more so in in economics. I mean, mm. by the time people start to thinking, think about alternative economics, this, this economics 101 of uh, that there's just um, uh, households and, 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 um, uh, and the industries and, and that is all that hap matters and, and nature isn't part of the system and, and care work isn't part of the system and power and, and money, money accumulation is not part of the system. Uh, by, the time, by the time they get out of the bachelor course, they, they have internalized that so much that it's difficult to think of something different. Uh, so I think we really also need a change here, a, a very rapid change. I recently heard a colleague in Iceland, she said, close down all economic departments and all universities and start new. Um, yeah, that's radical. But, but I think it does have something to do with the way we think. I mean, uh, having things is, is what we're being taught and what we're being, being uh, told incessantly from, the, from, the, from television, from, from whatever, uh, that you have to have things. And uh, well, it's just not true. 
And um, I think that is something we really need to question and, and uh, discuss, uh, which is another point. I think we need to talk a lot more to each other. We need to discuss a lot more with each other and find out that um, uh, other people make do with much less uh, in, one, in, one, in one area, but maybe they have more in another area, but um, that we can live a good life without so many things. There was a follow-up question about um, how, how to decide which industrial activities are part of this good life, because who, who can choose such a, who can do such a decision? I mean, we are, we are lucky to live in democracies, and democracies should, it should be democratic decisions. I don't think we're looking for some, some um, great um, leader who tells us what's good. I think we really need to do this in a democratic manner. And in view of uh, the fact that we have to do with about half the energy, uh, this means we also have to reduce productions and we have to decide which productions to get rid of. I would get rid of arms production, for instance. That would be one of my, my favorites to get rid of. I think we could get rid of a lot of the, of the PR business mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of a lot of other things that, that we just really don't need. And um, uh, if, if those, those industries that produce things that are necessary for, for daily life, if they produce goods that are more durable, that are repairable, uh, then production already decreases. So um, I think there's, there's and, and the decisions about that should be in a, taken in a democratic manner, which means that we have to revive our democracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, our democracy at the moment is very much influenced by interests, and uh, essentially, you can go and vote, uh, but what the, what the party you voted for uh, promised before the elections is not necessarily what they will do after the elections. Um, was very clear in the case of Mr. Trump in the United States, um, because he has an electorate that really comes from the from the poorer section of the of the population. But what he did was all for the richer section of the population. So I think that, uh, that we we have to regain our democracies, and uh, this is best started, I believe, in the communities. Uh, so start in your own community. Um, get engaged, politically engaged, um, discuss with the political functionaries, uh, with the mayor, whatever, um, and I think then um, this whole thing will, will transgress to the higher levels, at least I hope so, because starting at the top European level is rather difficult. Any other inputs from you? Wow. Yes, there's one question there. Um, Maybe. I want to get back to the point uh, Renate Hammer spoke about. It was these buildings, they are made mainly by investment. Uh, I, was, I was going by bike yesterday along the Danube and you see this Sorovia Tower. On the other side you see Bubok. Bubok makes a win of 15%. That's the profit of them as far as I know. How can we break, and it's not only for buildings, it's also mm. for producing t-shirts, it's producing cars and all that stuff. How can we break the influence of money, of investment, of profit, of money searching for profit? Mm. I think that's the main question. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can take one more from, from back here in the white shirt. Thank you. Um, I have two points to say. The first one, there are a lot of solutions and great ideas in the world, but we shouldn't forget the uh, people factor, as we said. And we always say we have to change our minds the way we think, but we shouldn't forget that we are emotional um, species, that we also have emotions and sometimes they are much, much stronger that, than the way we think. And getting back to the question of communication and sufficiency, maybe a good way to show that sufficiency could work is just to show how people can appreciate the things they have, people they have in the world we have, because 
about the issue of appreciation, we don't talk that much. We talk about the solutions, but we don't talk that often about people. And the second thing that I wanted to ask is um, how young people can, um, how to say, convince the older ones that they have rights to talk about climate change, that they are I, they, their ideas worth um, what we are doing. Like, for example, I work in a company where 90% are white men in their 50s, and they don't, just don't listen to what I say, and it's just very frustrating to change something if, we, if they say only, I don't have time for this, it's not important to me. So what should we as young people, especially Women, what should we do? How we should communicate this? Thank you. Nika, do you want to respond? Yes, I'll, <laughs> I'll respond to the latest question. Um, I, I often experience this as well, and whenever I come to panel discussions that are not only women, but like are, like you said, men in their 50s, the old white men, um, they often know each other. I come into the room and they shake hands and they talk. They don't really see me, they ignore me most of the time. And then I come on stage and, and start talking and I see it in their faces and they, they think like, oh, she does have something to say and she does have interesting thoughts and ideas. Um, I think sometimes we just have to take the stage and like make people listen to us. It's, it's not that they, like they give it to us. You have to, I, I don't know how it is in your company, but if you have, ever have the chance to go in front and present an idea of yours, do it. Because most of the time, people don't even think about you having ideas. And that's the reality. <laughs> Maybe I I'm, I'm, may add something. Um, I was uh, for nearly 20 years part of the Baukulturbeirat in the Austrian Chancellery. And uh, I saw many chancellors coming and going. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I saw one of, of those really looking out of the window and saying, oops, now we have to do something. And this was after three times the Heldenplatz full of young people. Not because, Fridays for Future, not because of what they were saying, but there were so many of them. And this is democracy, these are votes. So show that you are many. John, more than a question, I have a comment that is aligned with how can we achieve sufficiency, how can we forget about maximizing profit all the time, and it goes aligned with what the lady behind said. Uh, maybe we can forget having for being, because we are so busy having and having more and more and more profit that we forget about very important aspects for our lives. For example, having good social relationships. That's a key aspect for being healthy and for being happy. And we don't have the time, we don't have the resources to build strong connections with friends, with people. So what about having sufficiency and forgetting profits in pro of having good social relationships, having friendships, having a emotional connection with the people and increasing uh, what, what is not material, what cannot be in the market because it doesn't have a price, but provides for our well-being, for our health, and for our happiness. I would like to, to hear what the panelists think about that. Do you want to start? Well, I think that's, that's something very important, and I think it's, it's even scientifically proven that uh, money does not make you happy. I mean, I'm not talking about people who, who have a real lack and who don't know how to feed their children the next day. 
But if you surpass a certain level of income, after that, your happiness does not grow with more income. And I think that is true for the individual, but it's also true for, for societies. Uh, the United States, uh, the American society, for instance, was happiest in the 1956, around 1956. So after that, the GDP has been growing, but people have not become happier. And I think that is something we need to understand and to realize. May I take this occasion to say that I will have to leave in a few minutes, and I'm sorry <laughs> to have to go, but I have to catch a train to some outlying place in Lower Austria, and that's the last one I can catch. So uh, I would just like to say goodbye and thank you for your interest. Thank you so much. Are you going now? Okay. We will, to, to conclude, um, one, more, one more question. There is one over there, please. Yeah, thanks, Christian Felber from the Economy for the Common Good movement. I just want to bring in an experience from mid of May in the European Parliament. There was a conference on degrowth with the motto less is more and there were 2,000 participants on the site and another three to 5,000 in the live stream. And um, the community agreed at least on three referential concepts, which is the ecological planetary boundaries, we know that since last year we have crossed six out of nine of them. The second is the Earth Overshoot Day. We know that it has moved backwards to 2nd of August this year. In Austria we are on April 4th. And the third one is the ecological footprint. And we know that it's 1.6 global hectares per person. And uh, there is no single African country which has overshot. But Taylor Swift has overshot between five to 10,000 times, just for instance. And taking these three referential concepts as analytical concepts, the three proposals which answer some of the questions in the audience would be we could declare limited individual ecological consumption rights which amount exactly to 1.6 global hectares per person first. Second, replace GDP by a common good product or a gross national happiness or any other directly by the citizen composed new measurement of holistic welfare, which includes social cohesion and trust and happiness and health and all the things uh, that really matter. And the third one could be a sustainability report of all companies that is directly derived, that is directly de de derived from the common good product or from the macro measure, but there should be a link to the micro uh, level. Now we are talking separately about sustainability reporting and beyond GDP. And if there is a direct relationship, then the whole economy um, gets a new architecture. And I think this new architecture, um, which includes the efficient management of scarce ecological resources, would be the revolution of economic science that Helga krom kolb was just suggesting, but uh, unfortunately she has just left. But maybe her message uh, is remaining in the room. And this is my, my three cents to her message. Thanks a lot for that input. Um, do you want to either add to this or as closing remarks, um, what are you taking away from, from, this, from this event this afternoon? I can start. Um, I think I'll take away that the whole building sector is a bigger sector than I've ever imagined in terms of <laughs> fighting the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Because we've, um, I think I've learned a lot here and I'll take a lot of that with me and also into my activism because also in my town there's so many vacant um, houses and in, at the same time they build new houses on like the outside of the town so things like that I'll just take with me in the back of my mind and and take as an inspiration for for future projects definitely yeah, for me, it's really important to, to work in parallel. We, things like we do here, talking it over and over again is, I think, really important because we, we need to strengthen ourselves. And the other thing is that we really act in our personal lives and where we stand in our professions. It's really important to start or to go on doing and, and take out 
power of things like that, so I'm very thankful. Thank you. Thank you all for listening, also at home. Thanks for, for joining um, from home. There will now be um, a buffet downstairs, as, as we heard before. And um, yes, thank you so much for, for joining this debate. And um, please, if all the students could come to the stage again um, to take a photo um, and hope to see you downstairs.